medical information and cosmetic therapy. Uh, so yesterday, um, we finished with a uh, derivation or a sketch of a derivation of Hawking radiation and black hole temperature. Um, and specifically, we spent some more time looking at Rittner space than the black hole, but then I tried to argue that the black hole uh, calculation essentially follows the Rittner space calculation. Um, before moving on, I want to um, yeah. So I want to I want to say a few more words about that situation before moving on. Okay. So um, let's let me redraw this picture of Rittner space. Okay. So this is uh, black Minkowski space. P and X. Okay. And then, sort of, this Rindler wedge that we're focusing on on the right has coordinates which look like this. So, um, recall that the, these lines were lines of constant t, and these lines, which are trajectories of accelerating observers in the notation from yesterday. Lines of constant R star, which is like the coordinates coordinates. Um, and what we did yesterday is uh, talk about look talk about modes on this side and modes on this side, and saw that in the usual just in field theory, the Minkowski vacuum looked like an entangled state, specifically the thermal field double state. So I will write that again product over omega, uh, sum over n omega e to the minus uh, okay. So it's an entangled state between the left and the right, and uh, the left wedge and the right wedge, and it's, uh, you know, this n omega is the occupation number of the mode with Rindler frequency omega. Okay. Um, so I wanted to say a few more words about this before moving on. So first of all, I, you know, when we were talking about which kinds of functions were entangled with each other, this, you know, these these states here are occupation numbers of modes which look like plane waves in the in the Rindler coordinates, okay? So remember if I look at the Rindler uh, variable for a massless field, the effective potential of the, um, the effective potential of the, that the mode solved is actually zero. So these things look like plane waves in terms of this coordinate. But I didn't really, I mean, this was just sort of for convenience. I could have done the same sort of thing with wave packets instead of plane waves, and I would have gotten similar conclusions. So let me just um, write write that say that in pictures. Right? So let's say instead of having a instead of talking about a plane wave or a wave that takes up all of the right half, let's look at some kind of wave packet. So like a wave packet, which in, um, at t equals zero sort of takes up this much space, and let's focus on the right movers. Yeah. So, and it's a massless field, so it's basically just going to propagate at the speed of light in this direction. And if we followed it back in time, it would go like this. Okay. And if I continued it past with a Riddler boundary, it would just take off. And uh, this guy is going to have an entangled partner okay, on the other side, on the left side. So there's sort of a right, you know, Riddler modes, even wave packets, not necessarily plane waves have entangled partners on the other side. And to sort of figure out what the entangled partner is, we take this picture, we flip it over, we take you know x to minus x, and then we flip time as well. Because as you'll recall, the uh, you know the, the Rindler time on this side goes up and the Rindler time on this side goes down. So if I do that, flip it over, then flip it this way, I end up with 
from right over on this side. So there's some entangled pairs, and I didn't draw it properly, but they should be equal, equidistant from the origin. Okay. And um, if I take them to have, if I if I look at several such pairs, let's say they get closer and closer to the horizon at t equals zero, but have sort of fixed width in Riddler frame, so fixed width in R. So if I drew these guys here, maybe a wave pattern that looks like this with some fixed width. But then let's translate it over here and look at you know just a sequence of such wave packets that get closer and closer to R star equals minus infinity, so closer and closer to the horizon. Because of you know the redshift factor, R star equals minus infinity, you know, bunches things up here. So we end up getting shorter and shorter wave packets closer and closer to the origin. And their partners on the other side are shorter and shorter, and these things are entangled. And this is just, you know, uh, this is a reflection of the short distance entanglement in quantum field theory that came up in uh, Anindra's talk. Okay, it's, a, it's, it's, it's the same kind of phenomenon, but I just wanted to mention. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention is, okay, so we talked about the uh, Minkowski vacuum and how, you know, from the point of view of an inertial observer, nothing happens, okay, as you cross the horizon. Um, you don't see anything, and that sort of fixed what the state was supposed to be. But um, what if we focused on just the theory of the right wedge alone, not embedded into the larger space? And you know, if I just took this state by itself, or the Rindler vacuum, for example, what would it look like? Okay. What might it look like? So here's a question. What does the Rindler vacuum look like? Well, the answer is it's probably complicated, but um, we can uh, we can, we can actually deduce some of its interesting properties, which, or one of its interesting properties, which tells you right away that it's kind of a badly behaved state. Um, we can ask about the vacuum energy. Okay. Uh, in particular, we know that the vacuum energy of this state is zero, okay, because it's just the Minkowski vacuum. Yeah. Um, from the point of view of a Rindler observer, if I took this state, which has vacuum energy zero, and looked at its density matrix on the right side, it would look like a thermal state, which, you know, as I said before. A thermal state is filled with particles which have you know, a thermal energy density. Okay? So the total energy is zero, but at the same time, you've got a bunch of particles that have you know, a thermal density of energy. Um, and in fact, the energy density diverges in the particles as you go to the horizon because the proper temperature goes to infinity, as discussed yesterday. Yet the total energy is zero, so that tells you that you know the vacuum that this thermal state is built on has has sort of a built-in vacuum energy which cancels the vacuum energy cancels the thermal energy of the particles. It's a different energy, so if you you're talking about one is uh, the energy with respect to the global time, while the other one is. The the guy that is a very large temperature is the, the Hindler temperature. Um, yes, but if I, both of these things are encoded in the energy momentum tensor. Yeah. No, I understand, but, uh, but, but uh, if the energy that's zero on the vacuum is yeah. not very large near the horizon, it's still locally very small. The one that's the sort of large near the horizon is the Hindler energy, which is a different than evolution. Um, Yes, I mean, in, 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 in this state, the total the energy is zero. Forget the state, the, the, the energy. The, 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 the energy operator, say you take the Minkowski energy, that yeah. guy has zero energy, and the other ones also have zero energy in the same state. And basically... In, in, this, in this state, it has zero energy? Well, the co that combination has zero energy. This that, that's not this, an eigenstate. This combination. The whole sum. This, yeah, this whole sum has zero energy. And each one is not an eigenstate. Right, right. Okay. But so, but uh, we can not thermal. I mean, it's, it's thermal in the, for the other Hamilton. So the one that looks thermal with a very high energy is, uh, is the other Hamilton, which is a different one. It's a different time evolution. It's not the same operator. Uh, I'm not. There's no representative state here that has a lot of energy from the point of view of Minkowski. 
What do you mean by representative state? Is that the thermal, like, is a sort of a thermal uh, a uh, ensemble? A thermal ensemble, yeah. yeah. take a representative state in, in there, and yeah. that's sort of the energy that, that's being given by yes, that. No, I, in, I, the, in, the, in the Rindler I, I, energy, but it's sort of zero energy. I agree that the, a representative state here has zero energy. In, in, yeah, just just like the thermal state does, a representative pure state of the ensemble uh, has zero energy. Yeah. But I think the point that I want to make now is that this is not a representative state. The, vac the vacuum. So it's not an eigenstate. I don't know how you assign it. It's very far from being an eigenstate. I don't know what it means to have zero energy. It has it has a given it has a given builder um, energy, but no no the mean Minkowski energy is not well defined. Well, like but I mean I can take an expectation value. This is not an important point. It doesn't matter. The, 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 the more important point is that the um, the more the, the more important point is that the um, is the point that was already made a second ago is that the if we took a pure state so if we look at the if we look at the uh, if we look at the density matrix okay this is uh, thermal from the Rindler point of view. And if we took a sort of representative pure state from this ensemble, okay, which is not close to the vacuum, it's some <coughs> some excited pure state, okay, it will have properties that look almost exactly like uh, almost exactly like the thermal field double state. This is just how thermodynamics work, okay. Uh, even though it may not, even though it may not actually, you know, if you tried to cross the there may not be such a thing as across the horizon if we're talking about a theory that's just the Rindler, just the Rindler theory, not embedded into a larger theory. But um, a sort of you you could still talk about states in just the Rindler theory, which look close to the close close to the smooth state. Okay. Um, but states like the Rindler vacuum are not typical in this ensemble, and so will not look. So, um, so let's uh, go back to black holes for a second. And now I want to revise. So I have this cartoon picture of a black hole. And we're just going to look at it from the outside. I had a cartoon picture of the black hole that I started with um, yesterday. And I want to revise it based on our new understanding of um, black holes as warm objects. So um, yesterday I said that if you looked at a black hole classically, you would see you know all the stuff that was that was on its way into the black hole. You would kind of see it kind of take years of arriving. Okay. Um, and you know even you know if you trusted the classical geometry and didn't know anything about Hawking radiation, you would say all right that's fine. Uh, but uh, actually. If you looked at a black hole for real, that's not what you would see because it's warm. Okay. Um, as something falls into the horizon, yeah, if you're looking at it from the outside and you try and watch it fall in, you'll see, you know, signals. So here's something falling in. It's on its way in, and you're looking at it, so you see light coming off it. Okay. When it gets close to the horizon, the light coming off it is going to be redshift. It's going to be harder and harder for you to see. And eventually, it's going to be indistinguishable from thermal radiation coming off of the black hole. This is a process of thermalization. Okay. Um, so actually, what you see when you look at the black hole, you can't actually distinguish the things that fell into it. What you just see is you just see you know, sort of just this warm bath of radiation. If you tried to probe the black hole by lowering something into it, and pulling it, you know, taking some readings and pulling it back out, for example, um, like a thermometer. If you lowered a thermometer down to here, down to near the horizon, and then pulled it back out and see, you know, see what it read, uh, you would see that it measured, you know, the local temperature here. If you brought it down and covered it above the horizon, it would measure the local temperature, which, uh, sort of, as we discussed yesterday, the inverse of the local temperature. Is given by the um, the Hawking temperature, 
which is uh, 1 over 4 pi rs times the sorry, 4 pi rs times the um, factor that sits in the metric. Okay. I'll just write the metric again. And all of the properties would look as if you know it had this kind of temperature. Uh, in particular, if you lowered things down too far, if you tried to probe the black hole closer, closer and closer to the horizon, you would find temperatures that diverged and, in particular, went above the Planck scale or the spring scale or things like that. And so, uh, actually, it becomes very hard to tell what's going, what the black, how the black hole will respond if you try and probe it very close to its horizon. Um, and this, this sort of motivates the introduction of something called the stretched horizon. Okay. Instead of talking about the black hole's boundary as being at the horizon itself, we're going to, we're going to stick an imaginary surface around the black hole. So this is now a time-like surface as opposed to a null surface. So this thing is called the stretched horizon. And the point of the stretched horizon is that it, it kind of marks the boundary uh, beyond which we're not really sure how to compute because of things like the local temperature divergence. Okay? So um, we have to stop, we have to, you know, we can do field theory outside of the stretched horizon or for lowering probes outside of the stretched horizon, but um, inside of the stretched horizon involves Planck scale or string scale physics. Okay, so where do we usually put the stretched horizon? Um, well, in order, you know, let's let's work in the framework of uh, string theory, although it doesn't really matter. Um, it's we'll put in some string length outside of the stretch horizon. So it's in the case of us, you know, this is kind of ambiguous, but it, I mean, the exact definition doesn't really matter and it's sort of the obvious thing in the case of a spherically symmetric black hole. You just surround the black hole by a sphere, um, an, a sphere with constant acceleration which is uh, you know, L string outside of the black hole in um, you know, torch or beam. The point, of, the point of this is to, um, well we'll talk more about this in a second. All right. And so the point here is that from the point of view of the outside observer, someone who never tries to fall into the black hole, how do they think of the black hole? They think of the black hole as a warm, a warm membrane uh, located at the stretch horizon. which they can interact with. Okay. So uh, instead of thinking of a black hole as, you know, in terms of the geometry, you know, in terms of this picture, right? So here's the Penrose diagram for a black hole in flat space. Instead of thinking of a black hole like this where, you know, I'm out here and I'm going to toss things in and they're going to fall through. Instead of thinking about it like that, we're going to place the stretched horizon outside of the black hole. So here's the stretched horizon. And if I tried to, you know, toss something into the stretched horizon, the stretched horizon would absorb it, react to it, and then spit some things out. Okay. So we can assign different physical properties to the stretched horizon, like, you know, uh, conductivity and things like that. And this is known as the membrane, you know, the, the, the idea of replacing the black hole by a membrane, whether or not you place it at L string, that's what doesn't matter so much. 
<coughs> but basically as a membrane which encodes essentially the boundary conditions of, of fields on the outside of the black hole. That's called the membrane paradigm. Okay? And it's a sort of a really useful way to talk about black holes. The thing that's strange about this picture is that you know, if you're an observer who's falling in free fall, you're supposed to not see the membrane. Okay, that's the strange part. But uh, we'll get to that eventually. So is there any time dependence on the area of the space horizon? Um, no. No, but I think sorry, <laughs> Yeah, it's a it's a it's a time like curve, but it's a curve of constant radius, of constant r. So it should have a constant area. Um, Yeah, let me say one more thing about this, about another function that the stretch horizon performs. So, um, let me draw one more picture. So, you'll recall yesterday I mentioned very briefly, if we wanted to do, um, if we looked at the tortoise coordinate and the potential that a massless quantum feels in terms of the tortoise coordinate, I said it looks something like this, okay? where out here the potential vanishes and it reduces to Riddler space. And here is you know, some combination of the centrifugal barrier together with uh, the gravitational potential and things like that. And the height of this barrier depends on L. Uh, so this barrier is located pretty, you know, pretty much at, um, in terms of not, in terms of, if, if in this location, R star is part of the definition R star, but in terms of the Schwarzschild coordinate R, it's located at R is uh, 3M for um, Schwarzschild black hole, three halves the Schwarzschild radius. And uh, its height, you know, basically is like L squared, the angular momentum, L, L plus one enters the, L times L plus one enters the equation. So in order, if you had a mode of this energy, if you had a wave packet of this energy that was coming out of the black hole, okay, you would have to tunnel through this barrier in order to make it to infinity. And that's, that doesn't happen very often, especially if L is large. So what happens mostly is somewhere over here is the stretched horizon. And we should think of the stretched horizon as this warm membrane that keeps emitting photons, or keeps emitting, keeps emitting particles. And if, they're, if, they're not, if, they, if they don't tunnel through this barrier, or if they're not energetic enough to get over it, they're gonna hit the barrier and bounce off, okay? Most of them will bounce off if they're at lower energy, okay? So kind of in between the stretched horizon, which is located roughly at r equals 2m, or just outside, and r equals 3m, there's uh, sort of a lot of activity, stuff bouncing back and forth, okay? It's kind of different from out here where you have things just going outward. Um, this region in here is is called the zone. Okay, this is sort of I don't I think this name is kind of new in the last year or so. It's the region between 2m and 3m where you have kind of um, where you have uh, particles that can bounce back and forth. And this region is sort of in equilibrium with the stretched horizon because there's a lot of interaction, whereas things out here just free stream away. And uh, the zone. The sort of modern way to think about it is you should think of the zone as really part of the black hole um, because it's kind of in equilibrium with, you know, if you think of the black hole as consisting of the stretched horizon, maybe some degrees of freedom, some theory on the stretched horizon, you should also think of it as consisting of degrees of freedom in the zone because they interact, you know, pretty strongly or they, they're sort of in equilibrium with each other. And you could ask, you know, how much entropy is there in the zone? if I just counted the entropy of the field degrees of freedom here. Um, and if you do this, you know, you'll find, uh, you'll find that the answer depends on the location of the stretched horizon. There's one of these cutoff type problems in terms of, uh, you know, you try to count, try to do some kind of, thermo I say the thermodynamic entropy, since these, this region is sort of in thermal equilibrium between here and here. And if you try to count the thermodynamic entropy because the temperature gets hotter and hotter as you go this way, it diverges. If there were no stretched horizon, it would just go to infinity. But um, the stretched horizon sort of provides a cutoff. And the entropy of the zone kind of looks like the, it's the area of the horizon 
just the area of the horizon measured not in Planck units but in string units if you place the stretch horizon at the at, at, a, at a string length. Um, and because the string scale, the string <coughs> length is bigger than the Planck length, the zone has a significant, uh, significantly fewer degrees of freedom than what we normally think of as the black hole itself. But it's still proportional to the area. Anyway, I'll try not to talk about the zone too much. I think it's, it's mostly a distraction. But uh, it's another thing that, you know, the stretch horizon plays a role with. So I wanted to say a little bit more about you know what's an example of something you can do with the membrane paradigm. How should we think of the membrane? <coughs> so like I said, the membrane. Um, actually, you know, I'm going to redraw this picture in a second. We should think of the membrane as a real physical object. It's sort of like you know it's a it's it's a it's a boundary to the world when we're on the outside, and there's some kind of some kind of you know, theory living on it, okay? Which is the theory of the black hole. Um, but it's kind of a it's kind of a weird theory, and we don't know anything about it. This is, you know, one of these things which is classified as quantum gravity physics or Planck scale physics, which we don't know anything about. Um, but we can kind of deduce certain properties that we expect it to have based on um, some simple thought experiments. So um, let me draw Rindler space again, except I want to think of this Rindler space, even though I'm going to draw it as if it were in, you know, just in flat space, I want to think of it as the near horizon geometry of the black hole. Okay? So here's the inside of the black hole, here's the outside of the black hole, here's the black hole's horizon, and here's the stretched horizon. It has some It has some uh, some acceleration, okay, in this picture. So this is a Lindbergh stretched horizon, but we're going to think of it in terms of a, of a black hole. Um, and we really, I really only care about this part. Of the um, so what would happen? Let's do a thought experiment where we drop an electron into the black hole. So we take our black hole and we give it some charge. Okay, so. Here's us dropping an electron. So here's the world line of an electron. Okay. In terms of Minkowski coordinates, it's just going, it's just sort of standing still, sitting here at uh, at seeking right time. And to avoid distraction, let me erase the model. We'll just start at t equals zero. Okay. So at some point, this electron is going to fall through the stretched horizon, and then what's going to happen? So the, what's going to happen, the picture to have in mind, is uh, here's sort of the, here's a picture of the stretch horizon. Okay? So these coordinates I will call y1 and y2. Okay? They are the transverse coordinates, so they go out of the board in this case. So here's the stretch horizon where the electron is going to fall through. And then what happens is the, the black hole is going to absorb the charge. Okay? And the way we're going to think of it is we're going to think of the charge as diffusing. It's going to start, you know, the electron is going to fall through the stretch horizon at a point, and then the charge is going to diffuse outward, and eventually the whole surface of the black hole will kind of become charged. Okay. And how can I make this picture precise? Well, how do I figure out what the what what is the surface charge on the horizon, or the surface charge on the stretch horizon? Well, I can identify the surface charge in the same way that I would identify the surface charge in a conductor, just by the normal component of the electric field. Okay. So we can just calculate, what is the normal component of the electric field on this surface as a function of time as, as the electron falls through? This is basically the method of image charging. You know, we're imagining that once the electron hits here, it kind of disappears, and it's absorbed, it's absorbed by the membrane, and then the membrane does stuff. Okay? But the physics of the membrane is, uh, is con um, constrained by the fact that it has to reproduce everything that we would have